Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Literary Lutheran Reads in Our Lutheran Middle. This episode is for Thursday, and today we read pages 80 through 82. The Lord's Prayer, that most perfect and beautiful of all prayers, makes exactly the same point. Why do we need to beg God that his name be hallowed, his kingdom come, and his will be done? Because on every side in the world, and in the church, in my life, and my flesh, God's name is always under attack. Judged by outward appearance, it always seems that God's name, his revelation of himself and his word, is being thrown aside and under the bus in favor of unbelief, doubt, and indifference. It seems that his kingdom, that is, his rule in our hearts and lives by his word, is always on the brink of being overtaken by the rule of the devil, the world, and our own sinful flesh. It always appears as though the will of evil men and of the evil that lurks within the shrine of my own heart and soul is about to win the total victory. So day and night we cry, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Then in recognition of the fact that the devil threatens to rob us of even a crust of bread and to destroy all order in family, in church, and in state, we beg without ceasing, Give us this day our daily bread. It is sad that so often we let these petitions fall mindlessly from our lips that we are not starving to death, that we still believe the gospel, that the word and sacraments are still in our midst, all of that is proof that God answers prayer. Without his answer to this, his own prayer, we would have perished long ago. That he answers the prayer so richly, even when we mindlessly pray it, even when we have forgotten to pray it, is yet further testimony to the richness of his grace, yes, and of his providence. Then, wonder of all wonders, after God has answered those first four petitions, we still have to pray, forgive us. God in his providence and answer to our prayers, and in spite of our past sins, preserves his word among us, thus he hallows his name and preserves his kingdom. Thereby he accomplishes richly his good and gracious will among us. In answer to our prayers and in spite of our past ingratitude, he also gives us daily bread and a measure of order in family, church, and state. Since he has answered those four petitions so richly, how can it be that we still sin and that we still, therefore, need to pray this petition? All of the excuses we might have for sin are gone. Will we sin through doctrinal error or perversion? Not where God's word is preserved by him in his truth and purity, and we cherish that gift of his word and grace. Will we sin by greed or envy or worry about tomorrow and the day after? How silly! No, how perverse that would be. We know that our Heavenly Father answers the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray and has rescued us from war and famine, from terror by day and calamity by night. We need not fear the devil or his hosts. We need not worry about tomorrow. We have no reason to complain about anything in the present or dread anything in the future. But still, after God has done all of that, we still cry day and night. Forgive us, we have not treasured your gift of the gospel, nor your preservation of it in our midst. Forgive us. We have neither appreciated your abundant gift of daily bread, of peace in our land, of order in your church, nor have we permitted your gift of these treasures to so capture our minds that we trust you for them. Instead, we worry and fret as though you have never given us anything. Instead, we grab and gripe as though we were lords and you but our bondservants. That petition and its place in the Lord's Prayer is a most humbling recognition of the depth of our need. In spite of all he does in his word, in his sacraments, out of his providence and in answer to our prayers, there will never be a moment in our lives when that cry for forgiveness is out of place. But even more than an acknowledgement of our constant need, it is an evidence of his far greater grace. Jesus knew when he gave that petition that perfection in us would always be a distant and elusive goal which we would reach only in heaven. Nevertheless, he bids us to pray, forgive us. And by inviting us to pray such a petition, he promises that he will hear, that he will answer, and that, yes, he will still forgive. And again, he promises those things even after he has taken away any possible excuse in us for sin by answering the first four petitions. Lest we forget that our whole lives, each hour and every moment, depend on him and his grace. He further bids us to pray, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. He knows us so well, and nevertheless loves and cares for us. 
The simple fact of the matter is that without his answer to our prayer, we would run into one ruinous temptation after another and finally fall totally into the clutches of the devil. And so we cry in expectation of his gracious answer. Put a wall around me so that I am not tempted beyond all possibility of rescue. Then deliver me from the evil one and his snares, snares that I am too weak and foolish to escape on my own. And finally, in the hour of death, rescue me from every peril and all evil, and take me to yourself in heaven. In recognition of the fact that we ask for, that we ask for in this prayer is high and holy and utterly beyond our reach, we close it in worship and adoration. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. We will leave it to others to argue about the canonicity of that line. The truth it expresses is, however the argument comes out, fitting and sublime. Only God is big enough, mighty enough, and gracious enough to satisfy these needs of ours that surround us our whole life long. And as we sigh, Amen, we call to mind again the promise implied in the fact that Jesus himself has taught us so to pray. If God were not willing, even eager to answer this prayer, Jesus would not have told us to pray it. God does not joke with us in his word or play mind games with us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. This has been the Literary Lutheran Reads in Narrow Lutheran Middle, and I wish you all a blessed day.